beer bottles. I have just diet Snapple bottles everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I have a corgi. Hi, corgi. Oh. Be quiet, buddy. Huh. Yeah. No, you need to be quiet. Okay, folks, hoping that we are live on Facebook. Um, okay. And uh, um, for those who are just joining us, by the way, there's a little bit of technical issues going on with Facebook right now. So hopefully we are live on Facebook. Uh, I'm Jonathan Mayberry. I'm the editor of Don't Turn Out the Lights, a tribute to Alvin Schwartz's scary stories to tell in the dark. And uh, I have a fantastic panel with me tonight, and I'm going to have them introduce themselves, starting with Gabby. Hi, I'm Gabby Triana. I'm the author of Wake the Hollow, Summer of Yesterday, the Haunted Florida series. And I have a book coming up in November that I've co-written with YouTubers Sam and Colby. And um, don't turn out the lights. <laughs> it doesn't. Courtney. Hi, guys. My name is Courtney Alameda. I am a YA horror author and a comic book writer who hails from Idaho. I live in the middle of a legit potato field. Not even lying. Potato <laughs> fields are out there. Um, my most recent novel was Seven Deadly Shadows, which was an urban fantasy with horror elements that I co-authored with Valin Mayatani. And I've got a bunch of really cool stuff coming up that I cannot talk about, unfortunately, because none of it is announced. So, yeah. <laughs> <Michael>. <laughs> Uh, I am uh, Michael Northrop, so I'm the author of um, 12 uh, novels for um, uh, kids and teens uh, with Scholastic, and now uh, my second uh, graphic novel with uh, DC is coming out um, in April. So my first one was Dear Justice League this year, and uh, the new one is Dear Supervillains. Uh, we've got a cover reveal coming up, I believe, tomorrow. Um, so excited about that. Fantastic. Chris. Uh, I'm Christopher Golden. I'm the author of many books and comics and various other things. Uh, my latest novel, Red Hands, comes out in December. Um, and comic book wise, I have co-created two comic book series with Mike Mignola in what we call the Outerverse. And the new series coming in March, I think, from the Outerverse with Mike is called Lady Baltimore. Uh, and it's, uh, how do we describe Lady Baltimore? It's a queer horror thriller comic series set in our larger universe. Cool. Tanya. Hi, I'm Tanya Hurley and I'm coming to you from Brooklyn, New York. Um, I am the author of the Ghost Girl series, uh, the Blessed Trilogy and several uh, TV and film projects I've done. Um, and I have a middle grade um, horror book coming out um, early 2021 called Feather Vein. And I'm working on a YA novel for Macmillan currently. Fantastic. And I'm also a multi-genre author and comic book writer currently working on a secret project for DC Comics. And, uh, but uh, also the, the creator of V Wars, which was a Netflix series. And I am so happy to be the editor of this book. Um, for those who are, who are watching uh, via Facebook Live, hopefully watching via Facebook Live, you can post any questions you want in the chat section and uh, we'll, we'll answer them as we go along. But I wanna start off with, with just a, a real simple question to, to the, to the uh, panel here. How, how and when in your life did scary stories um, come onto your personal radar? And uh, again, we'll start with Gabby. Let's go around that order for, and then move. So I think it came out in, was it 1983 or something? I was already in middle school or maybe even high school. I, I don't remember, but I remember seeing it in the stores and thinking, man, I wish I was still a kid. You know, I, I can't read this. This is for kids. And, but I, I got it anyway. And then later in the nineties, I was a teacher um, for fourth and fifth grade. And uh, which was just a profession I chose simply to extend the amount of time I could read children's books. And my classroom was filled with kids books and Scary Stories to Tell in Dark was the number one binder falling apart book in the classroom. So, and I, I would, I loved reading one a day to the kids during, during October. So cool. it's always been on my radar as far as I can remember. Nice. Courtney. 
I don't remember specifically when I discovered this book series. I was either in fourth or fifth grade. I might be the youngest person and the only millennial on this panel, I'm guessing. Um, but I was a kid when these books were coming out. And I remember being in my elementary school library and seeing the cover for probably Scary Stories 3. I'm guessing it was Scary Stories 3. And just thinking, oh, now. <laughs> That looks, yes, that looks amazing. And I opened it up and it just scared me, just witless. I loved it. And so I ended up picking up all of the other books and reading through those and just checking them out of the library over and over and over again. Fantastic. Michael. Um, I think I, um, my first experience with the book was actually like, just like the, the ripples from the book. Cause I was in, would have been in, um, summer camp, uh, the year that came out, or the year that it really made the splash. And um, so I think before I read any of the stories, I heard like everyone's like knockoff versions, like, at the <laughs> camp, right? like and I was still at a very scarable age. I am still at a very scarable age. And I definitely remember like all these like stories, like that, I mean, it's pretty remarkable how fast, like, like kids will like take something and make it their own, right? Like all these stories about one-armed, you know, like uh, ghost, camper, th like whatever things. And it was definitely, I was like, where are all these stories coming from? And, um, and then I, I discovered the book and I was like, oh, this does explain a lot. Um, but yeah, definitely that was my first really vivid encounter. Just like, just like everyone with their own, like, take on these scary stories or their own like sort of telephone game version of the one that they read, you know? Uh, That's great. Chris. Uh, you know, it's funny. I, I, aside from Jonathan, I suspect I'm the oldest person on the panel. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, well, I said aside from you, Jonathan. And for me, actually, I didn't discover these books. I graduated from high school in 1985. So I didn't discover these books until my own kids were in school. And I actually picked them up for myself at a school library sale, like, you know, a school, not school library, uh, like Scholastic Book Fair, a book sale at the school. Um, so that was, you know, and I bought them for myself. <laughs> cool. Tanya. I have a similar story to Michael's. Um, I grew up in, you know, the woods and the, the, the mountains in Pennsylvania, and we camped all summer long. And I heard these stories, everyone would have these stories. And, you know, I heard them for years, the, that oral tradition, you know, around the campfire. And then um, when I was in the Strand in the early 90s, when I moved to New York City, I was in my 20s. And I, when I moved and I, I discovered the books there and I was like, hey, they, that wasn't their story, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it all came to light there. But I love how you know, kids can take these books and make them their own. They're, they're, the, they're the authors. They, you know, they read, they read the, the story and then it, they make it their own. And that's just my favorite thing about these books. Nice. And my, my introduction to them is actually in the introduction to the book. Mm -hmm. I was being older than all y'all. I was a, I was working as a bodyguard at the time and uh, wanted to go camping in the, in the Jersey pines and try to get myself spooked out. It's because I was thinking about writing something creepy. And, and I wound up getting spooked out by them. Uh, I, I really enjoy these stories. Now, when, you know, th this, this book is, is a curated anthology. So I reached out to you folks about this. Um, there are a few slots that were open to open call, but you guys are people that I actually reached out to. Um, when you, you know, when I reached out to you, first off, why, why did you say yes? And second, what's the journey from uh, getting the, the request to write something and landing on the story you actually wrote? So we'll start with Tonya this time. Go backwards. Um, well, I mean, I first of all, it came from you, so yes, immediately. Um, <laughs> Shows you what bribes can do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I was super excited to get it. This is my this is this is this is my favorite thing to do is write horror for you know teens and and you know middle grade. So I, I was super on board. I love the books, and um, I guess my it was kind of hard for me to think of what to write about. Um, but then I kind of, you know, I love the stories like um, the red, the, the green ribbon. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that story. Those feminist horror stories <laughs> from way back when. Um, and so I 
decided to try to write my own feminist horror story and that's where Pretty Girls Make Grapes came from. Fantastic. Chris. Um, you know, interestingly for me, uh, I hadn't written YA or middle grade in, in a number of years. And so I was really excited to, uh, to return to it. But more importantly, I just thought I want to write a story that would have been for me when I was a little kid, you know, that would have scared the crap out of me. And um, so that was my intention. I was writing the story for me as a little kid uh, and also thinking, well, I want to scare these kids, but also I want them to love scary stories as we all do, you know, this, these books inspire that. And that was just sort of my thing. It wasn't just about scaring them. It was about giving them a moment that they went, oh no, you know, and uh, uh, yeah. So my story is called The Open Window. And um, weirdly, even though it's, uh, it was written for kids, I think it's one of, if not the scariest stories I've written. Cool. Michael? Um, yeah, I mean, for, for me, I mean, yeah, same. I love horror. I love scary stories. Um, you've got all that blackmail on me. So, um, right. Immediate. Yes. But, um, the, and it, also I almost immediately, I knew the story I wanted to do because it, there are two things I think of when I think of, uh, scary stories tell in the dark. And one is like the urban legend kind of aspect of some of the stories, but the other is like the folk tale kind of thing like the folksiness of like handed down uh, ghost stories and um my when I was a little kid like my my granddad told me like this very folksy handed down um sort of scary story about what happened to little kids who talked too much and of course I was a little kid who talked too much this was very much a story with a point for my granddad, but like target audience. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I immediately thought of that um, story and I've just, it's in story that I've, you know, carried with me my whole life, but I've never really had a good, like the right venue for um, never quite fit in any of my books or anything like that. And so like, it was immediate. Yes. For me. And, it, and almost immediately I knew the story I wanted to tell. Cool. What about you, Courtney? Um, for me, I'm very much like Michael. Um, the stories of Schwartz's that really resonated with me were those visceral stories of folklore or cultural monsters that had been passed down for generations. So the one story that I always carried with me was the Wendigo, um, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. That one just terrified me as a child. Um, it continues to terrify me as an adult. So I wanted to focus on another like cultural or f monster from folklore. And so that's why I decided to write about the weeping woman. Almost immediately once Jonathan emailed me, I'm like, oh, I wonder if anyone has written a Schwartz like <laughs> tribute story about this. And when I couldn't find anything, I said, yeah, that's it. I've got to write about La Llorona. <laughs> I love the art on your story. Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> oh, I, I love too. it. Yeah, I just got the book, so I haven't read it yet, but I saw the art. It's amazing. It's so <laughs> creepy. Gabby? I have trained for my for this moment all my life, Jonathan. <laughs> I um, have been reading scary stories my whole life. I, I, I taught kids uh, of this age. I, I know what they're into. I know what they love to read. We shared that same love um, in the classroom at, you know, all throughout the year, I would show them scary stories in the, in, on TV, you know, probably stuff I shouldn't even have shown because it was just my way of sharing that passion with them mm -hmm. and the love of story. So, you know, and now I write for kids and, and teens. So yeah, I just, I knew I was, I was destined, but now I just chose the cat. I, I chose, don't you see that cat? Um, Cause I love cats. And I also know that kids love animal stories. And um, I just decided I, I wanted to write a, a ghost cat story. That's, that was, it just jumped into my mind. It was either that or something to do with baking something you know baking people and i'm like no no we'll go with the cat one we'll go with the cat one so that's how i got there well and props for the easy bake coven shirt that's that's i know <laughs> that's i love cool. that shirt <laughs> all right so we're gonna we're gonna take a couple actually before i get, take questions from uh, from what uh, viewers um you mentioned the art and the art in this in the original series by stephen gremmel was fantastic we were really fortunate to get Iris Compiet to do the art for our book. And she, I, and I really feel she captured the feeling of, of not only uh, the original scary stories vibe, 
but you know these stories you guys wrote you know originally it was going to be no art and then it was going to be just five pieces of art and i kind of lobbied for every, a piece of art for every oh, story yeah. and i'm really happy with the art i'm going to have, have put it, probably get all of them printed out and framed for my wall ah, because beautiful. they are wonderfully she's creepy standing job yeah yeah she's mm -hmm. she's great she's from the netherlands um a really great artist and uh, does a lot of uh like dark crystal stuff and things like that so okay so we take some questions from the audience um Gavin Car uh, Cooksley asks, where would you suggest I start with your books? And this is for, for you guys. Um, so we're going to start in the order that, that uh, the names appear here. Courtney, where would someone start with your books if they're not familiar with your writing? If you're not familiar with my books, I would start with Shudder. Um, it's probably the easiest place to start. OK. Um, next is Gabby. Um, I would say if you're looking for paranormal or, or horror, I would start with Wake the Hollow. Because before, before that novel, I wrote um, YA Contemporary, and then I, I did a switch to what I truly wanted to write. And that was Wake the Hollow was the first the first of that. So Nice. Tanya? I'll probably start with ghost, the Ghost Girl books, the first Ghost Girl book. Cool. And, and the title is just Ghost Girl? Ghost Girl. Mm -hmm. Chris? Uh, I would probably start with Ararat, uh, which came out a few years ago. And, and by the way, that's not a kid's book. Some of these are not, you know. So oh, it's definitely not a kid's book. <laughs> um, I would imagine the, the people watching this are not kids. So this is a good place. Right. For them yeah. Well. I mean, it's def Ararat is definitely not a kid's book. On the other hand, I started reading Steve when I was probably in, what, the fifth grade. So, right. you know. Yeah. I, I, I started with uh, The Haunting of Hill House when I was a kid. So, Ooh. Michael, <laughs> what about you? Where, where should people start with your stuff? Well, I mean, if they want to read a, a graphic novel, they should start with Dear Justice League, since that is the one that is out now. Um, but um, for my books, I would say uh, Trapped. It's about a group of kids trapped in their oh, high yeah. school mm -hmm. in a huge blizzard, right? It's very, um, it's YA, but it's um, a lot of the readership is um, middle grade. Um, the, the characters are like freshmen and sophomore. And I think a lot of middle graders like it because it's like sort of like a little like peek into what high school. Nice. might be like apart from blizzard um a lot of adult readers but so i think and it's it's my style um yeah so probably trapped would be the best place to start cool and jason williamson's asking for uh this is for everyone what was your starting point as an author and anybody can can jump in on that one or i'll pick someone since you're all <laughs> what are we defining as starting point <laughs> yeah yes. that's that's that was my question yeah. you know like you mean what inspired us first or what we wrote first? Well, a little bit of both, maybe. Um, okay. Yeah, okay. Like, Good, Michael. We're taking our like actual starting point and then fast forwarding to like the less embarrassing thing. We can actually like- <laughs> any, any way you want to answer this. <laughs> <laughs> like the, what, what's the starting point we're willing to share with the public? I mean, I, I started out with short stories, right? Um, a, lot, a lot of actually um, horror sh short stories. And the stories, they, you know, they got, they got longer, right? And so they got longer and then eventually I realized, you know, I need to be writing a book. Of course, the first few were, were very bad. Um, and then it's probably, the th I think the third one that got me my agent and then the fourth was, was published. But, you know, um, it was just, yeah, a question of like in high school poems and then, after that stories and the stories got longer and then eventually I was ready to write books. Cool. Um, I'll go. Right. Uh, I wrote, um, I wrote uh, a, actually Ghost Girl started off as a feature film script mm -hmm. and it was optioned by Robert De Niro's company, Tribeca. And, you know, they were trying to get it made and it was going through, I was going through all the meetings and I met with Bob Weinstein <laughs> and and um, he said, oh, this is great. We love your writing. You know, we love the story. He said, but th we have one small note. That's it, one small note. And I was like, oh, wow, okay, whatever it is. And he said, um, she can't die. And I was like, well, then you don't like the story because she dies on, <laughs> like, in the beginning of the book. That's the story. Well, so I was like, you know what? I, w I was like, you know what, I'm going to. I, I might, this might be the stupidest move of my whole life, but I'm just going to pick up and try to do this as a book. And <laughs> I did. Oh, good for you. Gabby, what about you? 
Did you call me? Yes. Okay. Um, I guess officially I've been writing since I was a kid, since um, third grade, I remember writing fan fiction. I was writing um, Mary Downing Hahn fan fiction. I'd read a book called Wait Till Helen Comes, which scared the bejesus out of me. And, um, and started trying to copy, it was about a ghost, uh, kids that move into a house and a nearby ghost on the property tries to like lure them to the lake where she died. And so I just fell in love and started writing uh, ghost stories back then. And then um, in the, about 1997, I started writing middle grade while I was a teacher because of you know knowing the audience. And then officially I didn't get, um, I started publishing in 2002. That was when I got my first um, two book contract with Harper Collins, but it wasn't a ghost story. It was um, just contemporary why it was backstage pass on Puanita. Nice. Chris? Uh, <clears throat> I, the first, I don't remember what it was. I started writing something when I was in grade school, something to have, putting a whole bunch of heroes together in one thing like Green Arrow and Tarzan or something. Um, but I, um, I guess I wrote my first short story um, probably my freshman year in high school. Uh, and it was one of two. One of them was called A Cold Familiar Feeling, uh, um, which was about a guy who, uh, who thinks he's being stalked um, by a killer. And then of course it turns out at the end that he's actually the killer and he just didn't know it. Uh, not good. And, uh, and the other one uh, was about uh, a guy who um, uh, saves his, he and his friends are drinking down at the train tracks and one of his drunken friends stumbles onto the tracks when there's a train coming and he, he saves his friend, but another kid dies and he like goes insane at the end, you know, it, you know but again, just sort of like testing the waters, you know, is that everybody? Um, yeah. Me, and I'm going to tell an embarrassing story, so I promise I'll make it worth it. Um, so I think most of us started writing when we were kids. Not all. I'm sure there are plenty of writers who decided later on in life that they wanted to pick up their pen and start writing novels. Either way you come to it is great. Um, for me, I was an English major in my last semester of college, and I took a graduate level writing seminar, which was one-on-one -on -one with a professor. So every week I'd write a short story and take it in and he would literally sit there and read it and critique it right in front of me. It was an absolutely harrowing experience, like probably <laughs> one of the scariest things I've ever done. However, towards the end of the semester, we were chatting about my goals and things like that and what I wanted to do. And I gave him my final like thesis project. And he was like, you know what, kid, like, you're good. Like one of these days, you could be the next Stephen King if you wanted to be. And this is where it got embarrassing, right? Because I turned around and I said to him, with all my youthful naivete, I do not want to be Stephen King. <laughs> and, like what most of us would give now to be Stephen King, right? <laughs> I was 21. I was an idiot. But uh, that's kind of where I got my start was I had, I'd always been writing. I'd always written stories, but a professor said to me, look, like if you keep at this, you might be good at this someday and you might be able to make a living at it. And, you know, it took me how many years, 15 years to finally really get going. But here I am on a panel with some really awesome people. Well, I, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's funny with 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 my background. I you know I went to journalism school. My intention was to become either Woodward or Bernstein because it was right after the Vietnam era and all that. Uh, I didn't. I mean, my first novel. I didn't write and uh, get that published until nineteen until I was um, forty eight, right, in two thousand six. Really? So I'm I'm late to the game for you know for a lot. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I love the form. Jason, I didn't know that. Yeah, Jason Williams asks. Um, how many of you prefer short stories over, say, novels? I will start with uh, Gabby and whip around. Um, I wrote short stories more when I was younger and in middle school and in high school. I entered a few in some scary story contests and won some ribbons at the fair and that. And then, but as I got older, I just got into more long form and novels. So every so often, I'll, I'll write a short story just to get an idea out or you know just to see where it leads and if there's enough there to develop into something longer but for the most part i i stick with novels what about you tanya um i just i i don't really write a lot of short stories um but i do prefer them i i think they're a lot of fun and they give you you know it takes a few weeks maybe and instead of like a year so <laughs> it's like an instant kind of 
satisfaction more, but, but, but it is, does take more because you have to be so concise and tell a whole story within, you know, a few pages. And so there's a definite craft to it, which I don't think I'm near mastering at all. So uh, it's fun for me to learn. Um, so I think I'm maybe in the learning process. Short cool. Stories. What about you, Chris? You've written a bunch of short stories. Uh, only by dint of longevity, Jonathan, I, um, I'm 53. I, I didn't, I sold my first two novels before I sold my first short story. So I had sent, I had submitted a few short stories and not been able to sell them, but I actually was just working on my first novel. Um, and uh, I think, I still don't think I'm great at it, short stories, but uh, I think that over the last like five or six years, I've actually become a much better short story writer than I was. Um, uh, because it requires discipline, you know, it requires, uh, uh, you know, a thoughtfulness that's a different kind of, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's a different kind of effort that go that goes into a novel. And by the way, uh, it was because of you asking me to write a short story for one of your anthologies, New Dead, that I wound up writing my whole Rotten Ruin novel series. I know. Grew out of a I'm short still waiting for my my uh, yeah, commission royalty. <laughs> Checks in the mail. <laughs> Michael, what about you? Um, yeah, for me, it was kind of a progression. I actually started out in school um, um, very into poetry. Um, that's the first thing I wrote. I'm dyslexic, so I had a very sort of adversarial relationship to reading when I was younger. Um, and, you know, you know, so I, you know, especially at the time, but still now, like, I, you know, I read very slowly and very carefully. And really, that's what you know, poetry is, right? It really rewards slow, careful reading. They tend to be quite short, certainly my poems did. Um, and um, and so that was the first thing I really gravitated towards. And then when I was comfortable writing more, writing longer, I sort of moved on to short stories. Um, and I love them because, you know, you can explore one idea, right? You need one twist, one idea, and you can really explore it. But then um, at a certain point I felt um, ready for more complicated stories where it's, you know, multiple ideas intertwined instead of, you know, one real idea, one good twist. Um, and so I sort of progressed from, you know, poetry to short stories to novels and now, you know, um, graphic novels. But I feel like, you know, each one sort of like informed the next one, helped with the next one. And it was just, I mean, I still love short stories, but I tend to only to do them when I'm asked to, which tends to be for anthologies. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what I was going to say, actually, is that's when I write short stories is when someone asks me to, whether that is an editor for an anthology or a professor at school, like the novel is where my heart is. I'm not good at brevity. Um, I'm learning because in comics, we have to write very, very brief. Um, however, yeah, that's com or short stories are not my forte, but I enjoy writing them when I do. Cool. All right. Uh, Gabby, did we get your answer on that one? Yes. Yes, we did. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm jumping around a little bit. Okay. Um, Francesco Tignini asks, which authors, uh, which author or authors uh, are your primary inspirations? And we're going to start with Tanya. Definitely, hands down, Shirley Jackson. <laughs> hands down. Yeah. Gabby? Um, R.L. Stein, who was on the panel a little bit. Um, yeah, Shirley Jackson, Anne Rice. Um, oh, yeah, Anne Rice. Yeah, Mary Pope Osborne. Uh, Lois Duncan, shout mm -hmm. out, uh, who I got to introduce at an SCBWI panel here in Miami a few years ago. It was a moment for me. Um, Stephen King, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Courtney? Yeah, I think Stephen King is, is a really strong pick for me. Um, I would also say Guillermo del Toro's work um, was hugely influential for me, especially Pan's Labyrinth. When I saw the pale man on screen, I realized, oh, people get to do monsters like this, like in actual, like published work, like people are doing these awesome monsters. So I think if anyone has been like a major, like watershed moment of inspiration for me, it was del Toro. Um, and also probably a lot of video games too. The name of the gentleman who did um, like Resident Evil and all of those like big survival horror franchises currently slipping my mind, but video games were also hugely influential for me as well. Fantastic. What about you, Michael? 
Um, I mean, yes, I mean, Stephen King also, and you know, his novels, obviously, but then also um, On Writing, which was just a really, yeah. really influential for me when I started writing. Um, and um, mystery writers, you know, I, I, it's something I aspire to. I'm not sure I've ever actually reached that level of just like clockwork perfection in constructing a novel. Um, but like, you know, early on, like Agatha Christie and then, you know, people like um, Henning Mankel and things like that, who just really just put the plots and the stories together so beautifully. And to me, that's what a, a novel is. You know, these, these threads just wound so perfectly. And it's, it's more something that I aspire to, I think, than I achieve, but um, the mystery writers are very inspirational for me. Yeah. Chris? I mean, too many. I mean, obviously my biggest influences are Stephen King and Rod Serling. Um, and, uh, you know, from a, when I was a kid, Essie Hinton, uh, Jack London, um, comic book wise, Marv Wolfman who wrote The Tomb of Dracula and Chris Claremont who was writing X-Men when I was a kid, um, you know, and then as I got older, a lot of mystery, like Michael said, mystery and thrillers. I mean, Dennis Lehane, his yeah. character work yeah. in the Andy Gennaro books, uh, the relationships in those books, um, how people are woven together in a neighborhood, big influence on me, Walter Mosley, um, uh, you know, recently, um, and I, it, I still, you know, I find these influences still hit me a lot. Um, uh, S.A. Cosby's new book, Blacktop Wasteland, what an inspiration. Um, I don't know, uh, Elroy. Um, yeah, too many. Cool. All right. I just read the new Margaret Atwood, The Testaments. Um, oh. <laughs> oh, it's so good. But anyway, so I feel like I'm inspired uh monthly you know right. and that, that's that's part of the fun of this too because some some of the authors those that are still alive often we get to know them uh which is a, a side effect of being a writer i never anticipated <laughs> I mean, becoming you know friendly or friends with uh some of the writers who who are influential on your work like james lee burke for me and steve king right you know, getting to know them was you know it's, just, it's like what you know never saw that coming. <laughs> um let's see patty miller asks have any of you ever had a, uh, written a story that ended up scaring you? So we'll start with Courtney. I'm really hard to scare. However, the one that I'm working on now um, is set in Paris during the Belle Epic. And it's hands down the scariest thing I've ever written. And it's been difficult to work on because some of the scenes are quite dark. So yes, actually, but only, only recently. Cool, Michael? I mean, it, it's kind of a chicken or the egg thing for me on that, because I, I mean, I, I feel like with stories and, and, and books is often, you know, it's like we're working through things that we're already kind of obsessed by or, or scared by, right? So it's just like, I don't know if a story has come up and like jump scared me so much as it's just given me the space to explore things that already really scared me and to spend like days thinking about things that freak me out, which, which yeah, scares me, you know what I mean? But it's like, that it's like the fear was already there. It just kind of gave it some oxygen, right? Some time to really think about these things. Cool, Chris. Uh, you know, I think that, I don't know if I can't speak for anybody else because this is such a personal thing, but I'd like to think that everybody gets this uh, elevated emotional state sometimes when you're writing horror. Um, occasionally, very occasionally, I'll be writing something and realize as I'm writing it that it is actually really scary. Mm -hmm. And it's not so much that I become scared, it's that I become elated. <laughs> I get into this mode where I'm like, oh, wow, this is actually working and this is going to unsettle. The person reading this is going to be really unsettled by it. And like I wrote this short story called The Abduction Door um, that I think is really unsettling and uh, and yeah. So occasionally, so it isn't a question of me getting scared. It's a question of me hitting that moment of awareness while I'm writing that, that what I'm writing is going to have an impact, is gonna make people feel what I want them to feel. And uh, as a writer, I'm usually not confident that what I'm doing is gonna have the desired impact ever at all. So occasionally you get that moment and it's wonderful. Tonya. 
Um, I think, you know, writing is more cathartic. I don't know if I have ever been afraid, um, you know, afraid, is that the question? If yeah. I've ever been afraid of anything I've written. More, more surprised, I think, you know, diving down into certain characters and, you know, it kind of gives you, like Michael said, that space to explore trauma and stuff like that. And feeling like my ghost girl books are about feeling invisible and it's kind of that surprise like, oh wow, this was traumatizing in, in high school and this this affected me as a, and I'm still affected as an adult by it. And so I think that kind of, that's why I love horror so much because you can really delve deep into those kinds of situations and explore them a lot. So more surprise, I guess. Cool, Gabby? Yeah, I was um, writing Wake the Hollow and I was at an old house that I was living at and I was downstairs writing a scene. The story takes place, well, in Sleepy Hollow and the girl has come back home to a house that she used to live in when she was a child, but um, it's since been sold. Her mother passed away there and they were estranged and there was just a lot of emotion um, there. And so she, you know, when you visit the house that you used to live in, like just you're hit with nostalgia. And so as she's walking through the hallways that she used to walk through as a, as a child and, you know, her mother's room and the, the marks are still where the bed used to be. And the, you know, it was just, it was just very emotional and it was also emotional for me. And, and then she's feeling like, she's just like, she's not alone. Like she's there alone, but she's not alone. She feels like the electric, you know, the energy in front of her, like there's just something, something is there. And yeah, when I was writing that scene, I, I just had to stop and I, I felt, I, I don't know if I was just so absorbed in it, what I was doing, but I just, I had to turn off the lights, turn off the computer, lock up the house, just like run upstairs with like blinders on, you know, cause I just, I just creeped myself out. Nice. Um, I just want to add that I, and it's funny cause I think Tanya was at least alluding to this that, um, for me, I've been way more successful in, in feeling grief and sorrow in things I'm writing yeah. because when I'm trying to create that on the page, I have to sort of get into that space right. and, and re-experience those kinds of similar emotions to give them to my characters. Um, so it's uh, not easy to scare me. Like, it's not easy for me to scare me, but it's definitely easy for me to get into that headspace where you feel those kinds of emotions. Mm. Yeah, I agree. So Ronald Signini asks, what urban legend or folklore scares you the most or scared you the most? And we'll start with Michael. Dramatic <laughs> silence. Like, Dramatic silence. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in a very, very small town, right? So um, a lot of it fell um, far away, right? You know what I mean? Like a lot of that, you know, like, um, but the one that I remember, and this wasn't, I mean, I guess it's, it was from a movie or I don't know, again, chicken or the egg, if the movie comes from this thing. But I remember the thing that freaked me out the most as a kid, and still I will think of sometimes, is the um, phone call coming from within the house thing, <laughs> right? Like where <laughs> you're like, just like the idea that like what's supposed to be your safe space is in fact already not only in danger of invasion, but has already been compromised and right. you have literally no safe place left to go. And the only thing to do, right, would be to flee outward, you know, to where you're unprotected. But of course you can't because, right, the kids are upstairs, whatever, you know what I mean? Like, and so that has always stayed with me. And I think I did, I saw that movie, which was maybe literally called something like that. It's coming from within the house or something like that as a kid. And it freaked me out. And that idea has always freaked me out. <laughs> Courtney? Um, I think it would be split. I'm not quite sure if we're talking about what urban legends frightened us the most as children or as adults. Um, as a child, it was probably, I saw The Exorcist far too young. Um, so it was probably the idea that um, demons could possess people through Ouija boards and um, 
make you do horrible, terrible things. That was probably what scared me the most as a child. As an adult, though, and living in a place that gets lots of snow, um, there is an urban legend in Japan about a snow woman called the Yuki Ana. And so every time we have three, five, you know, feet of snow, or however much snow we have gotten that year, I always imagine the Yuki Ana in the evenings out on the out on the fields because it's just creepy. It's a creepy story about a woman who freezes people um, and yeah, it just terrifies me every time. Nice. What about you, Gabby? Um, you know, when I was a kid, I can't really think of an urban legend that I was scared of, but when I was a kid, one of the first things that got me into just, you know, horror in, as a child um, was um, a record and it was called Famous Ghost Stories. And it was, I would listen to it over and over. And it was narrated by like some guy that did commercials in the sixties, like I think is Wade something. I, I hate that I can't think, remember his name, but it had, it had like eight recordings on it of different urban legends. And, but the one that struck me the most, even though it's not an urban legend, it's, it's a poster, it was a telltale heart. And it mm -hmm. was complete with, it was told, it was just so, ugh, there were, there were all these like creepy sounds and everything and it was one of the first stories that that wasn't a ghost story that really affected me because I, I am afraid of things that I can't see which is why I'm like so obsessed with ghost stories but this one was like one of the first stories where it actually occurred to me that like someone could someone that's not a ghost you know a human could hurt you you know this the, the old man with the eye and he's going mad and you know I was only like eight years old listening to this and it just, mm -hmm. it just stayed with me it just stayed with me forever that he was hiding something under the floorboard spoiler alert that's fantastic I, I, I'm pretty sure I know the album you're talking about was uh, famous ghost stories with with scary sounds yeah it's it had like a yeah. purple it had like a purple and moon cut that's it yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I had that too. Oh my god, I just had a you know vision of like being in my room with the record player and the headphones and listening to that. Oh, I loved it. What about you, Tanya? Um, I much like Courtney, I saw The Exorcist way too young, and um, I you, you know, know demonic you know, possession, a lot to answer for. Like, what's <laughs> too young? What's what's yeah. too young? Uh, uh. I, for that movie, 50. <laughs> but um, yeah, I just, I, I, I mean, it terrifies me. And that's really why, I, you know, one of the reasons I wrote the Blessed Trilogy is because I'm traumatized from it. You know, I, anything that can get from you, get, get you on from the inside, you can't run from it. You can't, you know, you, you can't call out for help because it's inside you. That's, that's just it and for me. Almost that's nobody terrible. can help you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How about you, Chris? Uh, you know, I, I, weirdly, I, I can't think of one like that, although I do remember that call is coming from inside the house folktale urban legend getting to me. I mean, the hook one, you know, everybody knew too, but there were variations on yeah. that. That wasn't really scary because it that didn't feel startle plausible. response. What's that? That was startle response. You could yeah. say that after any story. Yeah, yeah, but the cause everybody. inside the house is uh, is one that definitely unsettled me. Um, the first movie I saw that in, Michael, was uh, Black Christmas. Oh, wow. Um, which, but I don't think that was the first time it appeared in a movie, but that was the first, which was in the early 70s. I mean, I didn't see it in the early 70s. Um, yep. But... Uh, but actually, you know, I, I grew up, I'm, I'm the youngest of three. I grew up, my older brother is two years older than I am. And uh, I was definitely like the tag along annoying little brother. And so he would always try to scare the crap out of me to keep me from following him and his friends. So he and his buddy Gary would go into the woods to smoke cigarettes um, and they didn't want me to tell on them. So they told me that there were werewolves. Um, that, that there was actually, I, I think that they told me there was a werewolf motorcycle gang <laughs> um, which I believed that however old I was, I was like, so I was scared to go in this particular section of the woods to follow them. Uh, and then there was one time that he and the same guy, Gary, uh, uh, we were just home. My brother was looking after me and, uh, and they pretended that there was a burglar in the house, in the basement, uh, just to scare the crap out of me. Um, and so that was way scarier than any of these stories, you know, <laughs> I'm not scarier than the idea that a demon would possess you, but um, 
you know, by the time I was thinking about demons possessing me, I was also thinking, well, you know, I, there's a crucifix in here somewhere. I'm ready. <laughs> well, nice. So. All right. Did, is that everyone, right? Yep. Cool. Um, so actually I have uh, one, one of my own questions here. Um, with, with the, since we're talking about some urban legends and stuff, a lot of the, the stories that appear in scary stories are actually based on urban legends, including the hook one is, is, is in there and, and a bunch of others, as well as retelling of classic stories, classic horror, a bit of folklore and so on. Um, in, have any of those things, folklore or urban legends, influenced your writing? I'll start with you, Chris. <laughs> oh, don't start with me. Because I just, I was just like, I don't, uh, not that I could think of at the moment. Next. <laughs> <laughs> Tanya? Uh, oh, I'm laughing. <laughs> like, uh, um, no, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't understand the question, I don't think. Have, have, are any classic bits of urban legend or yeah. bits of folklore um, influenced stories that you've written? I mean, I'm, sh I'm sure. That I, you're aware of. Yeah, I'm, I mean, definitely, but I can't think of specifics right now. Yeah. Gabby? Um, not, not necessarily folklore, but, um, I mean, the short story, Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, I, I know it's a story, it's not, based, well, is it based on a legend, real legend? I don't know, but it's, I, it was one of my favorite stories, and the Disney, the Disney, um, interpretation, I have a cat on my desk. Uh, <laughs> okay. Oh. Um, yeah, so I've always loved that story, and it was the basis for Wake the Hollow. Um, so yeah, that would right. be it. Courtney? I think broadly, um, the only thing that's really influenced me is, again, kind of going back to the exorcist and my father's Catholic faith, um, because, you know, some Catholic tradition is really quite dark and creepy, and I've always just kind of loved the idea that there are, there's like an exorcist training school at the Vatican and all of these other kinds oh, of very I interesting <laughs> things. I know, it's creepy, but I just, yeah, I think it's so it's good, though. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So, well, it's not folklore. Um, but if we can include religion in, under that big umbrella of things, many people do yeah, include yeah. that under the umbrella. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> can I go now? Then after. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> we'll come, come back to me. So, so if we're talking about folklore in general that goes into mythology, I don't want to go into it. And, uh, you know, Gabby talked about the legend of Sleepy Hollow. I've certainly riffed on that, and I've riffed on Peter Pan several times in my books. Uh, including a whole novel called Straight On Till Morning. Um, and I have a trilogy called The Veil Trilogy. The first book is The Myth Hunters that's literally nothing but stolen pieces of folklore mm -hmm. from various, uh, you know, um, cultures around the world. Which is why um, I was surprised you, you blanked on that question because I'm thinking, <laughs> what about those books? Oh, but, but when we, because we're talking about urban legends and, and I'm folklore. thinking about folklore like, you know, the, like, like The Hook and stuff like that, not like this. Um, and of course, Mignola and I did a lot of that with Baltimore. Um, but um, since Courtney talked about Catholicism, <laughs> um, you know, my very, my very first novel is called Of Saints and Shadows, and it has six sequels. So there's seven books in that series. But it comes out of having spent 12 years in Catholic school and always not being able to make any sense whatsoever of the rules. Um, and, and the rules of Catholicism, but also the rules of vampires. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that bit of folklore about vampires, I would always think, well, so vampires can become mist and they can become wolves and rats and bats. So they could change themselves on a molecular level, but that's it. And it would drive me crazy. And I had to come up with a reason why they were limited to just that small menu of like, you know, uh, appetizer transformations. And, um, and I thought, well, you know, clearly something happened where the church, you know, did something to like, uh, brainwash them. And, mm -hmm. and so it sent me off on this whole process that actually started my whole career. So cool. Michael. Um, yeah, I mean, I was gonna say a myth too, right? Like, it's like the original, it's just like super well-written folk tales, right? So, um, 
And, you know, it's the intersection, right? Folk tales, religion, mythology, and like mythology has definitely been very influential for me. I mean, I have one series that's based on sort of mythology, uh, Tomb Quest, but, um, but apart from that, just like those archetypes, you know, they're so ingrained in us, you know what I mean? Like the, uh, they, you know, just, you know, what, what did Zeus do now, right? Like, or like, <laughs> like the, like the yeah. dysfunctional, like king family dynamics, the, you know, like, um, it's so ingrained in, in the stories that we read, right? So stories that influenced us were influenced by these myths and we're influenced by the myths. It just like, I know that mythology, right from when I was writing poems to through short stories, through novels, it's like has always been something that has really um, resonated with me. Cool. Now, there's one question that I'm going to answer because it's it's about how the book got got started. David Schmidt said, "How was the process or interaction between this collection and the original books, um, and how did how did you get the guidelines of how closely to stick to the original story from the collection and who picked which story?" Actually, what happened is the Horror Writers Association uh, made an agreement with the estate of Alvin Schwartz, the, the writer of the original books, to do a tribute anthology. And beyond that, we weren't given very many, you know, very, very much in the, in the way of guidelines. I created a set of guidelines. Basically, I wanted stories that were essentially flash fiction, you know, uh, 1500 words, give or take. We have a couple of uh, full length short stories in the book to kind of anchor that and show the different, uh, introduce younger readers to the different forms. Uh, but I did impose a lot of rules after that on the writers. I, I wanted them just to write a story that that would fit, you know, ideally read the original books or reread them um, and get a sense of what would be a cool story to tell. And um, I, I, I curated the book be, uh, for the most part, except for the, the, the few that came through open call, because I, I knew the work of each of the writers involved, you know, each of the writers on my list. And I, I had a really good instinct that they would be able to turn out the right kind of stories. And in fact, they did. And one of the things that I did when I, when I got the stories is I read each one aloud because I wanted to find out whether the story would work verbally as, as, as something that could be read in class or in fact around a campfire. And the, the very few that I got, I gave heavy notes were the ones where the sentence structure is either too complex or um, something like that where it, yes, the story was good, but it, it didn't work verbally. And we have a you know great audiobook. Um, we, we have Hillary Huber and Adam Werner who did the, uh, the audiobook. And you can tell from the way they do the audiobook, if you guys haven't had a chance to listen to it, it's fantastic, that these stories really, really do work as, as oral stories. Um, and I think kids are going to have a lot of fun reading them with, with each other and in schools. Okay, so I, we have a question here from Jason Williamson. Um, how do you start your stories? And this is a classic process question. Are you a plotter or a pantser? And for those watching who don't know the difference, a pantser writes by the seat of their pants. They make it up as they go. They don't have a full plan, whereas a plotter have, have either a very loose plan or a fully structured plan. So starting with Gabby, plotter or pantser? Um, I started out as a plotter because I didn't trust myself. I used to have every single chapter laid out so that I could just sit and start writing. But as, as I've gained more experience, now I just maybe plot the beginning, a couple key scenes, plot points in the middle, and maybe the end, maybe, and then just fill it in organically as I go. So combo of both. Cool. Tony? Um, probably a little of both, but more of a pantser. Um, I don't like to overthink before I'm starting a book because then I I get bored and I like, oh, I have to write to this part and I have to write, you know, it's like I like to be surprised and I like to go on the journey and, um, you know, have a looser kind of idea of where I'm going, but not really. So I'm more of a pantser. Oh, Chris? Uh, I think I'm more of a plotter, but I'm a plotter to the point where, um, you know, I... I just want to be able to communicate to other people the basic setup, the coolness of the idea, and then you know, and then the beep hits the fan, and uh, and I feel like uh, that's good enough to get me rolling, you know, get me get me uh, down the road quite a ways, and then I realize I have no idea what I'm doing, and then I stop, and I usually am plotting ahead a couple of chapters, so you know, I'll write those couple of chapters and say, okay, now I've got to figure out what comes next. Um, so I am a plotter, but I'm a serial plotter, if that makes sense. It does. Michael? 
Well, well you know, I started out as a, as a pantser and then I wrote a, like a five book series that had like a mystery element to it. And so then yeah. I had to plot that, right? Cause you can't mysteries, you can't just like pants them. Um, and I liked that process because like what I, I discovered when I was forced basically to outline five books in advance of writing even the first one was um, that you don't have to stick to it that religiously, right? You know what I mean? Like it gets you going and it keeps you, keeps you going. But it's like, if you find something better or you just get to know the characters better, you spend time with them, um, you can change it, right? It's your outline, you can change it. So I like to plot, but I also give myself a lot of latitude to abandon or revise the plot as I go. Courtney? Um, I'm the same as Michael. I actually started out as a hardcore pantser who planned nothing except where I wanted to end up. And over the last couple of years, I've been forced by circumstance to become a plotter. Um, so I have every little twist and turn plotted out beforehand. However, if, you know, in the process of creating the actual draft itself, the characters show me a better way or, you know, they do something that's really amazing and that's going to be much more interesting for the reader, I'll of course follow that. However, um, I've become quite comfortable with my outlines and synopses these days. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in the, the same boat as, as uh, Courtney and Michael. I, I do, I do outline, but I, I, don't assume that I've had all my best ideas that added my outline. So I allow for organic <laughs> growth. And, uh, but also, you know, I jump ahead and write the ending right after I write the first chapter. That way I can aim at it and plan. And, <laughs> it also speeded me up, you know, so it, it works for me, but everyone, that, that's the thing about this. And it's if I did that, that, I would be so bored writing the chapters in between. Ah, because I like all the devious stuff that, that you know, subtext and motif and all that. It, I guess it, it, it really depends on which parts of the craft resonate most with us as creatives. Yeah. And the reason I like questions like this is because it allows anyone who's a writer who's watching this to see that there is no one way. There are, it's, it's a, there are a lot of ways, and they often evolve as we evolve as writers. Um, there, there are, you know, like I, to me, the idea of, of, of pantsing my way through a novel would would drive me insane. I, I would I would be in a straitjacket in, in two days. So but I but some of you guys when I said that I write the ending, you know, you guys are like, oh no. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I feel like I, 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 I couldn't do that because I need to wait because I feel like it's a magic trick at the end. You know what I mean? You get to the end and you've got to wrap it all up perfectly. And then like a magician you have a flourish and you take a bow like at the end. And I feel like if I tried to write the ending, I wouldn't have any of the, uh, uh, I don't know, of the emotional content that I want when I'm when I'm putting it into that. See, I'm more of a mad scientist. I like the devious idea of, of you know, drawing people into the web. Everybody that would be a different challenge. I'll try that though. Okay. <laughs> All right, we have, uh, we're almost out of time here. So two quick, uh, quick questions. One, um, each of us lives near some independent bookstore, I would assume, even in the wilds of Idaho. Um, so if somebody, do you have a bookstore that if, if somebody wanted a signed copy, you could put on a mask and go there and sign copies conveniently? If so, sh give a shout out to that bookstore. So we'll start with you, Gabby. Books and Books, Coral Gables, Miami. Okay, Tanya? Community Bookstore in um, Park Slope, Brooklyn. Great store. Uh, Chris? Copper Dog Books in Beverly, Massachusetts, run by my friend Meg Wassmer. Nice. Michael? Yeah, I was going to say community books there too, but then, um, but I was, they also have Greenlight near me. Greenlight has a new uh, location on Flatbush Avenue, which is really cool. So I will say that, Greenlight on Flatbush. Fantastic. Courtney? Um, I would say King's English Bookstore in Salt Lake City, Utah. It's um, an hour or so away from me, but they know how to get in touch with me. So. Cool. <laughs> for me it's mysterious galaxy bookstore in san diego and uh you know that's uh, independent bookstores are are among our favorites one of the reasons is uh usually in independent bookstores the staff not only can tell you what shelf the book is on they can talk about the books they know the books there um you can have conversations about books there and that that's one of the great charms of the indie bookstores and i hope you guys all support indie bookstores and last question um where can people find you online so we'll start with you mm -hmm. Where can people find you online? Um, I'm on Twitter and on Instagram. So my Twitter is at courtalameda.com. Um, and then my Instagram handle is, I think it's at 
Courtney Alameda Books, I think. Yeah. Okay. Michael. Um, <laughs> you get me like literally on Instagram to check. So yeah, so <laughs> my, um, my Instagram is just michael.northrop. I don't know why it was so hard for me to remember that. Um, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it's like, and then that's like um, too. <laughs> and then my uh, Twitter is MD Northrop, as if I'm a doctor, which I am not. Um, <laughs> do you have, do you have a website as well? Oh yeah, it's michaelnorthrop.net. Like every year, I try and get the .com, and every year, like <laughs> I almost lets it expire, and then like renews it the last week. But so I'm still at the .net, I'm hanging out at michaelnorthrop.net. That's it, Chris. <laughs> I'm at christophergolden.com. I am on Facebook. Uh, I'm on Instagram, but I don't know my Instagram handle. <laughs> and uh, I'm on Twitter at Christoph because it's too long. No ER. Christoph Golden. Cool. Tonya. Um, at Tonya Hurley on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and tonyahurley.com. Cool. Gabby? Uh, GabbyTriana.com is the website. Gabby Triana, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I also have a YouTube channel called The Witch Hunt. Uh, where I do horror interviews and witchy stuff, witchcraft, um, just anything spooky and creepy and haunted. Cool. And Jonathan Mayberry, everywhere, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, you know, I think my even my MySpace page might still be active. God. Wow. <laughs> hey, I started out on Friendsters to give you an idea of how, how bad this, you know, and the thing is just spell my last name right. It's M-A-B, not M-A-Y-B. Um, Where can we find you on Genie, Jonathan? It wouldn't surprise me, you know, <laughs> at this point. Yeah. You know. um, so anyway, thank you uh, for tuning in, and thank thank you to my my wonderful panelists and contributors to the book because you guys wrote amazing stories in here, and I am so delighted to to be editor of a book with so many fantastic, weird, creepy, disturbing stories, and it makes me wonder what the hell's wrong with you all. <laughs> so thank you again, and thank you for thank watching. You. Good night. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.